I was very fortunate at the start of my career because I finished my college course down uh, in the south of England and then went up and knocked on the local studio door and the assistant had left the day before for London. So I was very lucky I was in and um, it was only a small studio and it was a residential. So I was helping out the chef a lot and, you know, hoovering a lot and just sort of learning, learning the ropes really. Um, but that was a great introduction and unfortunately that ran its course over a couple of years it shut down and I moved to London, moved to the city and after a bit longer handing out CVs this time um, I got uh, a spot um, as an assistant runner at Maloko Studio Group and that was really great because they have, um, they manage lots of studios around London and now the country and the world so you were put in maybe a Neve tracking room one day, you know, doing a rock band, and then the next year in a hip hop session on an SSL, um, and then a writing session in a small studio the next day. So you had to, you had to kind of know all the consoles, know um, how to deal with any problems on all of them. Um, so that was a good education. I sort of then, over time, progressed up to engineer, just gradually, really. Just you know, starting off doing small voiceover sessions and building up, getting in as much downtime as possible, and doing bigger and bigger sessions. Um, so I, over the years, worked a lot at Paul Letworth Studio, the Church in North London, which is um, an amazing facility. Really, it's got a big EMI Neve room, which is open plan, so there's no there's no separation between the control room and the live room. It's all in one room. And um, it's pretty large and it sounds incredible. Like you just put up the mics and it's, it's just there. So that's an amazing spot to work. And they've got a great mix room as well, like a G-series room that just is incredibly accurate. And um, then a smaller writing room, which is also great because uh, everything's just at arm's length. And then I guess I'm not at the church. I have my own studio in Strong Room Studios in Shoreditch, and that's just my room, so that's a bit smaller compared to the church. Uh, but I do a lot of mixing and production there. And then if I need to go anywhere else to do you know, a bigger session, I can go down to use the studios at Strong Room or back to church, or there's a few other ones like the pool in Bermondsey or Baltic Place in Haggiston that I really like. I guess it's hard to point one experience for me just working with the level of musicians that I've been fortunate enough to work on is every time just blows my mind because just seeing something being created there and come together at that level is just yeah never gets old really and it just it always sounds so good it's just just a case of capturing it as best you can obviously you got to be pretty fly on pro tools but it's important not to have your head buried in it the whole time. Try and, you know, look up, look around, see what's going on, try and listen to what the producer or the band or what people are talking about and what they might want set up next or a direction they want to go in. And hopefully you can then remain a few steps ahead of them and everything will just then go a lot smoother and a lot quicker. Welcome and thank you for tuning in to the Serious Sound Sessions, the second episode of Serious Sound Sessions, live from Abbey Road Institute in Amsterdam. Uh, our previous session was with engineer producer Ali Staten, where he deconstructed the mix of the Turin Break single, Keep Me Around. And the edited version of that stream can be found on our uh, YouTube channel with some behind the scene uh, material. Ali Staten was brought to you by Universal Audio, and they're also the ones bringing us our second guest for today. And today's special guest, also from the UK, he worked in studios like Miloco, currently for the church, uh, in the church, and has his own room uh, in the Strong Room studio, where he, has, where he does his own productions. Worked on groundbreaking records and artists, uh, ranging from Adele, U2, London Grammar, and the glass animals, just to name a few. And today he will be talking about the mixing process. Um, but it's not just going to be a simple before after session. He's also going to talk about parts which are well, happening before you actually enter the studio. 
Um, and also, of course, if you look at a mix, you have a record, it needs to be mixed, and you have a certain amount of time. How do you make those decisions within that uh, time frame? So, very important knowledge, especially for those starting engineers out there. And before we start, I have some final practicalities. First, you can watch it on Facebook or YouTube. Um, listen on headphones or speakers, that also uh, helps a lot. Uh, and if you have any questions, please leave them both on Facebook or YouTube in the comments below. And uh, we'll uh, have them answered uh, by Matt. So, yeah, that's it for my part. Thank you again for tuning in. Uh, please share this stream, also appreciate that a lot. But without further ado, Serious Sound Sessions, powered by Universal Audio, live from Abbey Road Institute Amsterdam, brings you Matt Wiggins. Hey. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, so, I guess, before we get going, a bit of background about why I got into this, uh, this game. So, when I was younger, I used to go into town, you know, get the records, bring them back, put them on, get excited. And I was sort of noticing, you know, everything was metering the same, but one was maybe louder, one was punchier, or like all of them from a certain record label had a similar sound or a similar feel to them. And uh, some maybe weren't so loud. I kind of wanted to know why. So I went to college a couple of years, came out of that. And I was really fortunate because the local studio knocked on the door and the assistant had left for London the day before. So I was really lucky. Um, it was only a small studio and um, I was, you know, helping out in the kitchen, mopping floors and, you know, setting up what sessions we had. But I learned a lot there. It was um, really great. But unfortunately, that ran its course and uh, after a couple of years shut down. So I moved up to London. Um, where I handed out my CVs to every studio I could find and eventually got a job interning at the Maloko Studio Group. Um, and that was great because they have a lot of studios that they manage all over London and now around the world and it kind of really threw you in the deep end because one day you might be tracking like a band uh, on an eve like this one and then the next you might be assisting on a hip-hop session on an SSL. And then the next, you know, in a small writing room, trying to make sure everything goes smooth. So you kind of, you had to know how to work all those sessions and assist in every one of those scenarios. So it really sort of, you had to know your stuff. Um, so eventually, you know, over the years progressed to engineer, doing, starting small and building my way up. And uh, I worked a lot in, Ben Hillier's studio in Bermondsey called The Pool. And that's where I started um, working on sessions by this producer, Paul Letworth, and we got to know each other there. And then I eventually went on to become his engineer, um, which was a fantastic experience. Um, so today, what I thought we'd do is take a session from Jermaine's band here, a student at the Institute, and sort of go sort of further back than maybe you'd usually see. So the original conversation and the direction and ideas that Jermaine had and how I've sort of applied those to a session and why I've made decisions that I have and tried to steer it towards Jermaine's vision, really. Um, so it's going to start right at the beginning and then we'll see how far we get uh, towards the mix at the end. Um, so... I guess right at the start, you're obviously contacted and provided a monitor mix. So that's the first thing you listen through to, you know, to sort of gauge whether you think you'll have, you know, you'd be able to have enough input on the project and if it's right for you. Um, so then I'd like to try and speak to the producer or the artist in the band, um, which is what I did with Jermaine here. And we went through the philosophy of the band and, you know, what their sound is and, you know, the members of the band and how it was recorded and basically where he sort of sees the song going. Um, so part of that conversation, we talked about references such as like bands from the, the late 80s, really, that sort of sounds so like Earth, Wind and & Fire, and then a few more modern ones like the latest Daft Punk record and a bit of Childish Gambino. And the purpose is to generally, you know, get some references that you can go and listen to or maybe you already know and you can sort of see how you're going to apply those to 
the the artists that you're working for. Um, so after that, um, I sort of got an idea of the sound. You've had to listen to the monitor mixes, and I wanted to see if there are any uh, aspects that Jermaine maybe thought we could take a bit further in the mix, but maybe he didn't have enough time to complete in the production or just areas that needed a bit more focus. So in this instance, it was the fact that uh, Jermaine felt the, fl the track was maybe a bit flat dynamically. There wasn't enough difference between each section. So that was something he really wanted to focus on and then retain the sort of vision of the band, the sound of the band, which is like the late 80s thing, but apply a bit more of a modern thing as well. So uh, let's have a listen to what I was sent, the monitor mix. In the interest of time, we'll cut it there. Uh, so you can hear, for me, when I'm listening to that, you can hear the 80s influences in the sounds of the synths that he's used and the drum sounds that have been used, like a Lin or similar, and uh, the effects as well on the vocals. So there's a definite point in the direction that he wants to go there, which is obviously great to have a start, you know, have that solid foundation. Um, so for me, I'm just thinking of how, you know, knowing the bands that he's referenced, um, taking aspects of those and applying them to what I've been given. So let's just have a look quickly at the session which I received off of Jermaine. Uh, this is pretty small and very tidy uh, in comparison to many sessions received. There's uh, maybe one plugin and everything's all nicely consolidated and in its place with the drums at the top moving through to the bass and then the synthesizers here with the guitars and the vocals at the bottom. Um, so uh, this was actually exported from Logic uh, where Jermaine wrote it and produced it into Pro Tools before it was sent to me. Sometimes I'll just receive the raw WAVs and I have to build a session. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, a much larger session and I'd maybe make some decisions to consolidate it down and bounce stuff so it's just a bit easier to focus on on the screen. Um, at the top, what we just listened to was the monitor mix, so that's essentially really important to get as kind of a, a direction. It's um, For one, it's kind of a, a place in time that the artist or the producer is, is happy with. They said, this is, this is what you're getting. Um, and it will have been sent around to labels, you know, friends, you know, it's like something that people have probably been listening to for a while and they're used to and they like the arrangement of. It's like that stage, sort of a line under that stage of the process, I suppose. So that's always good because you can um, sort of reference that, but also you can see maybe they're really happy with the balance and like you can check back and make sure you haven't gone too far astray from where they left it. but. Um, so that's always useful and it's always great as well because you, if there's something different, if there's something different between the session and the monitor mix, it 
sort of it's an immediate sort of warning flag and you can speak to someone and maybe get the right file or there's a, a base missing or like there's something missing so it's good to check and make sure you've got everything you should have before you get to the end of the mix and realize like half the bvs are not in the session but and yeah so it's good to have on that level as well so let's go and open my mix prep essentially uh, as i was saying it was delivered in a very tidy state so actually in this instance there's not a lot of difference between where i got to and what i was sent mm. so you can see i've kept everything pretty much in the same order the drums at the top with the bass and then some synths some more synths guitars and the vocals at the bottom i've sort of changed the colors but that's just the ones I'm used to. It doesn't really matter what colors you use. It's just that I know if I'm looking at something pink, it's probably a vocal. It just makes it a bit quicker to navigate around the session. So if we go to the mixer here, let's have a look. So on the right, I've got my uh, aux effects, my aux tracks with effects on. Um, and I've retained what I was sent by Jermaine. So I've got the original two effects plugins he had. And I've just added a few more that I think will help retain um sort of the place where the production is and sort of suits the references that i was given um so they're on the right and then like on a console i've got my sends to these effects on every channel so i don't have to waste time making them in the middle of a mix they're just there if i want reverb on the guitar i can just turn it up it's it's you know it's good to go so that speeds up the process so there we're on everywhere i've bust up the drums um, because it's quite common to sort of compress the drum kit together. So that's ready to go with a few parallels and a reverb that was on the snare already in there as well. So now it means I can, anything I do to this bus is applied to all of the drums. They're all in one place. So that's pretty handy. Um, and then on the top, I've got my mix bus with an EQ and a compressor and a tape machine on already, which I'll generally set at the start and then tweak as the mix goes on and then at the top here i've got my uh print tracks so everything's rooted to the mix bus and then that's printed here with on this channel and then i've also got a limiter here which is printed on the second channel so i can monitor the limited one that i'm going to send out when i get towards the end of the mix to make sure i'm not going backwards with the limiter, but also at a level that competes with other stuff that they'll be listening to on their computer or whatever. So, and then at the very top, we've got Jermaine's original monitor mixer there, which I've got on a, um, I can switch between using this nifty remote so I can just flip back and forth and again, make sure I'm staying in the right path. So yeah, not too much difference between those sessions, but that's because it was already very tidy. I'd maybe if i had like a large stack of backing vocals or maybe lots of overdubbed string sections i'd think about uh printing them down so it's just you know i get a balance which i can always you know open up and change later but it just means i'm not focusing on stacks of stuff on the screen it's just it's just all concise and nice and easy to manage and yeah you know, i can always go and rebalance it if i need to later on just a bit easier on the brain whilst you're sort of doing the creative part of the mix, I suppose. Um, so that, I think, kind of covers the prep. I'd also go through and sort of make sure all the edits are cool and if there's any clicks on the vocals or the bass, I'd kind of go in and denoise those or de-click those. So you're just basically separating the kind of slightly more dull tasks with the more creative stuff. So it's, yeah, you know, it's... It's all done. You don't have to worry about that stuff. You can just get on and put your ideas down. Um, so I think that's the prep stage. So that was in a good spot. So let's go and open up um, the next bit, which is the editing. So that's all the prep course. Cool. So the next thing I do is probably look at editing and um, so starting with the kind of foundation of the rhythm, the drums sort of seems like a sensible place to start. So let's go through what we've got here from Jermaine. And uh, it's a combination of 
uh, sort of an electronic drum machine and a live drummer. So that's cool. So for me, what I'm thinking there is I want to retain the groove of the drummer, um, but I want to just make sure the, 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 that, that groove is consistent enough throughout the song to go with the more electronic sound and the tighter sound that he sort of spoke about as a reference. So let's have a look here. So we've got the, uh, on the electronic side, we've got the kick and a couple of snare triggers here. And then we've also got some claps and toms, which come in over here. And a few cymbal samples as well. And then on the live drummer side, we've got overheads and snare. Cool. So let's just take a listen to all those together quickly. Says those. Uh, so for me, I'm hearing like maybe there's a few times where the electronic snare is flamming with the live snare, and also the groove across the song uh, is great. It just maybe goes up and down slightly more than I'd like um, when I'm trying to, when I'm thinking about the references that I've been given. So what I did was I used a triggering program to help me out with my editing. Now, there's a few triggering programs, and basically the idea is you put it on a snare track, and when the snare goes over a threshold, it triggers a sample. So one use of that would be, if you do it saying, mixing like more of a rocky song, you're sort of augmenting your live mics. So you've got your kick in, and you're like, yeah, it's cool, but maybe it just needs a bit more attack. So you've got your attacky sample, and you can just push it underneath. So it's not, not necessarily meant to be heard. It's more of like an aid in your mixing. So that's one use. And then another one would be where like you're really going for it. You've got a live drummer, but you want an electronic sound. So you kind of trigger maybe an 808 off its kick drum. So then you've got basically an 808 played by your drummer, which is, you know, obviously cool in a production sense. Um, what I did was actually, I just put the, um, the two drum machine triggers, uh, samples that Jermaine provided and put them on the snare track and just printed that. And what that did was meant I didn't have to go through and paste it on every one. It was already, it was just edited there. And then if there are any differences, I just chopped it out. So for me, I just used it as a bit of a time saver, which is handy. Um, so let's just flick to that playlist, open up the prints there. So it looks like maybe there's a lot of editing batch. It's just lots of tiny, tiny movements because it's really important to, like, it's really important for me to retain the groove of the drummer because that's, you know, it was great, it was solid. Um, I just, where it was a four to the floor and it's like a more electronic production, I wanted it to be solid, you know. So let's just have another listen to before. And then once I've edited it, Yeah, that's uh, it's a subtle difference, but I think the idea with editing is lots of little changes that overall add up to a more cohesive performance, and but still keeping the idea and the vision of the producer and the band. Uh, so let's go and open just the last session here, which is the main one. Then we can go through. I did a bit more editing on some of the synth parts and the guitars. Um, just to get them locked together again, sort of retaining the part and because they had a really nice laid back feel, but just the way they interacted, I felt could be benefited from a bit of nudging around. So we go check that out. So. Mm -hmm. Do, do, do. So the main sort of instruments in the chorus for me were this guitar here, this guitar here, and this um, sort of clavy thing here.
So if I play them together, you can hear how they work. So again, similarly with the drums, I thought they're both cool, but with a little bit of nudging around, uh, if I play them now, we hear that they kind of just lock a bit more. Yeah, so subtle changes, but across the whole multi-track, you can see I've done a little bit here, you know, a little bit up here. And it all just means it's, it's easier to get the balance and to get things working together as parts because they're not fighting rhythmically. Not that I think fighting's a strong word, but like um, they're just sitting together as, as one. Um, so I thought that made it all a bit tighter and more sort of a bit more of a modern edge to it. Um, and continuing on that theme, I sort of went on a bit with the bass. So if we look here, we've got couple of basses from Jermaine. We've got the fizzy one. So that's like a higher sort of chorus part. And then we've got a low one here as well. Um, so what I wanted to do was um, so to get a bit more tightness on that low end and the way I did that instead of editing um, was to use a gate on the low one but I've sent the fizzy one to the side chain of the gate so that when when the fizzy one stops the low one's going to stop as well um, with like this release that I've set here so it's not I haven't got it super quick it's not like too blocky but it just kind of fades out nicely and it means that you get a bit more of a solid low end going on so this is with the gate on, and you'll see that it kind of cuts it off here. So yeah, that's sort of tightened up the low end a bit in my books, which is, again, just means that everything's going to slot together a bit easier with the kick drum and the uh, other low end elements in the mix. Um, so then I'm sort of thinking about what Jermaine said about getting dynamics throughout the song. And uh, essentially for me, that's going to be changing elements between each section um, in a way that sort of sticks with his sonic references and his, um, like the bands that he's referenced as well. So if we kind of look how I've done that on the drums, we've can see we've got everything like locked together now it's kind of a bit tighter which is cool um what i've done is along with the original kick and my snare samples i've triggered a like an octave of the same kick that i was given so that in the chorus um when that comes in you've got like this extra octave lower on the kick so that sort of uh is sort of a subconscious opening up of the chorus as well so you've got this the original And then same thing with lower and I, I might have taken the top off, but like you're not supposed to know that another kind of kicks come in. You just sort of feel it and subconsciously you're like, oh yeah, that chorus is a bit bigger. So that's one way of getting a bit more dynamic. Mm. And similarly with the snares, so I'm oh, sorry, the claps. So we got Jermaine's, you know, clap that was provided and what I've done is in every chorus I've just added another one so you got those in that one and then like a third one comes in and then by the end of the song you got four plus the original claps so again that's just developing the dynamic of the song as it goes along and you know it's not it's supposed to be fairly subconscious um, it's just all adding a bit more size to each section as it develops um, other than that, it's just volume up and down and changing uh, throughout the sections to get dynamic there. So now let's maybe have a look at the individual sounds going on. So as well as our kick and our new kick that I've added and the new snares, 
uh, we've also got the live kit, haven't we? So what I've done is I've bust up the overheads and um, as well as compressing the whole kit together, as we said in this bus here, I've also done a bit of a side chaining similarly to the, um, not the base, but the pad we'll see later on. So effectively when the kick fires, the overheads are going to be ducked a little bit. Not, uh, but the idea being that not so much in a, a way that you hear, it's more just sort of making those two things glue together. So if we look at this. We can see that it's doing a little bit of sucking and ducking on that bit just to um, sort of get it together as one sort of sound, so glue, glue the two kits together effectively. Um, so they're all busted up there and then they're compressed together again with a bit of, just like, I'm using this mic amp here to distort the overheads to get them a bit more cutting, I suppose, a bit more aggressive, but then removing those a little bit, those frequencies that maybe are a bit too harsh once I've done that. Um, on the toms for that 80 thing, I've really gone to town and smashed those through a compressor so that they're kind of a bit more explosive. And with a similar idea, I've compressed the reverb that was on the claps. So that really sort of, you know, it's a bit more aggressive. It jumps out, it's a bit more explosive. So we can hear that with the toms in the last chorus here. So compared to the original drum sound. So for me, it's got a bit more punch and it's now got a bit more of a dynamic journey with the extra claps I've added there and the volume rides as well. So that's cool. That's kind of the drums sorted. Um, so going back, let's look at this pad. So again, referencing back to the um, Jermaine's concern about the, the sort of flatness of the track, I was listening through and this, there's one instrument, this Prophet pad, that for me might be the main contributor of that effect because it's frequency wise, it's pretty linear. It's like fully open and it runs the whole way through the song. So uh, I wanted to change that and hopefully add some more dynamic. So the way I did that was by changing the sort of frequencies that it had as it went throughout the song using this filter here. So we can see on the automation that in the start of the track, it's fully open. So it's just as was, excuse me. And then throughout the song in the kind of uh, the bits with which are supposed to have a bit less energy, it kind of filters down. And then of course that means you can ramp it back up again in the chorus. So then hopefully the chorus hits in. Um, and so I did that throughout the song, it goes a bit up and down in the solo and then right down for the middle eight and then bosh straight back up for the last chorus. So that if I do it sort of fading down here in the pre-chorus, sounds a bit like this. So there's a bit more dynamic from the filter. And carrying on, with the theme of trying to get a bit more movement into it as well, because I felt it was maybe a little flat. So what I've done, like what I did on the overheads, is I've keyed, using a compressor, I've keyed another element of the song to give it a bit more movement on the pad. So what I've used is this guitar here. So this is the rhythm of the guitar. Which I thought was really cool. So. I thought instead of doing just like the kick drum, so you get like a dancey, sucky thing going on, we just, I thought I'd tried using that as the key input for the compressor. Um, so that sort of sounds a bit like this. So 
you can see compared to without it, it's got a bit more movement now. So this is before. So yeah, for me, I took a bit of the mid range out as well because it's quite a, it's quite dense. So um, carved a bit of space out for the other elements of the track. I have a question from the uh, to Facebook. All right. So it's it's related to the previous part for the for the drums. Oh, and cool. The question was, um, what if the producer's idea was you have you have this difference in snare? So, what if the producer's idea was to have that difference in the snare? When do you decide to edit that? And how is that? Um, so, you know, having spoken with Jermaine and the producer, I knew that his band had a, you know, the drum machine and it had the acoustic kit. Um, so for me, if I can, uh, obviously, you know, I went through the editing, the purpose of the editing with Jermaine open and, um, for me that if they were, if the snare hits were brought a bit closer together, it'd be a bit more cohesive and achieve a bit more of a modern dance sound to it. Um, obviously the, the idea may have been wrong and we'll, when the first sort of reference mix goes over to the producer, we can talk about that or I talk about it on the phone as I was doing it. But, and it really comes down to also the genre is really relevant because maybe if it was more of a, a, a jazz piece or certainly orchestral, then you wouldn't really do any editing to that. But because of sort of what the producer's vision was and what we're trying to, um, what he's trying to achieve, I, I th um, the logic was that a nice tight punchy sound would give it that effect. So that means you have contact with, in this case, Jermaine, sort of explaining why you do things as well, or you explain? Yeah, so um, I guess it kind of depends on how big. So like there's some things we'll see later on in the mix that were kind of maybe bigger ideas than just editing and those sort of things I would certainly speak through with um, the producer. It's in this case, Jermaine mentioned that I had a fairly open free reign to go and add a bit of creativity, uh, which is not always the case. Sometimes producers are happy with the ones to mix and where they got to and they just want it maybe just a better version. But in this instance, um, Jermaine was keen to see what I could explore. Can I ask a question to Jermaine? <laughs> so how was that for you? I mean, the drums are really nice. And how was it for you to, you know, you had your ideas during the, to, during the production, etc. but then you hear the final version. So how is that for you? I'm going to give you this mic. So. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I felt it was a bit liberating because, um, yeah, you're going towards a specific sound which you have in mind with the people you work with, um, but but you also have a vision of where it should go to. And um, yeah, in this specific case, I'm like, yeah, let it go. <laughs> and uh, that uh, let the engineer uh, do his thing because uh, sometimes someone else's opinion adds up to the result and uh you can't always do it by your own because then you're limited to your own thought process and uh, for me it was quite interesting to, uh, to see that process and uh, to see what would be the uh, result and i really like that <laughs> 